everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. We are continuing with reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing tonight with Chapter 6, Touch System. Like most of Dad's and Mother's ideas, the family council was basically sound, and although it verged sometimes on the hysterical, brought results. Family purchasing committees, duly elected, bought the food, clothes, furniture, and athletic equipment. A utilities committee levied one cent fines on wasters of water and electricity. A projects committee saw that work was completed as scheduled. Allowances were decided by the council, which also meted out of rewards and punishment. Despite dad's forebodings, there were no ponies or roadsters. One purchasing committee found a large department store which gave us wholesale rates on everything from underwear to baseball gloves. Another bought canned goods directly from a manufacturer in truckload lots. It was the council, too, which worked out the system of submitting bids for unusual jobs to be done. When Lil was eight, she submitted a bid of 47 cents to paint a long high fence in the backyard. Of course it was, it was the lowest bid, and she got the job. She's too young to try to paint that, pen, that, paint that fence all by herself, Mother told Dad. Don't let her do it. Nonsense, said Dad. She's got to learn the value of money and to keep agreements. Let her alone. Lil, who was saving for a pair of roller skates and wanted the money, kept insisting she could do it. If you start it, you'll have to finish it, Dad said. I'll finish it, Daddy. I know I can. You've got yourself a contract, then. It took Lil ten days to finish the job, working every day after school and all day weekends. Her hands blistered, her hands blistered, and some nights she was so tired she couldn't sleep. It worried Dad so that some nights he didn't sleep very well either. But he made her live up to her contract. You've got to let her stop, Mother kept telling him. She'll have a breakdown or something, or else you will. No, said Dad. She's learning the value of money, and she's learning that when you start something, it's necessary to finish it if you want to collect. She's got to finish. It's in her, it's in her contract. You sound like Shylock, Mother said. But Dad stood firm. When Lil finally completed the job, she came to Dad in tears. It's done, she said. I hope you're satisfied. Now can I have my 47 cents? Dad counted out the change. Don't cry, honey, he said. No matter what you think of your old daddy, he did it for your own good. If you go look under your pillow, you'll find that daddy really loved you all the time. The present was a pair of roller skates. Fred headed the utilities committee and collected the fines. Once, just before he went to bed, he found that someone had left a faucet dripping and that there was a bathtub full of hot water. Jack had been asleep for more than an hour, but Fred woke him up. Get in there and take a bath, he said. But I had a bath just before I went to bed. I know you did, and you left the faucet dripping, Fred told him. Do you want to waste that perfectly good water? Why don't you take a bath, Jack asked. I take my baths in the morning. You know that. That's the schedule. Jack had two baths that night. One day, Dad came home with two Victrolas and two stacks of records. He whistled assembly as he hit the front steps, and we helped him unload. Kids, he said, I have a wonderful surprise. Two Victrolas and all these lovely records. But we have a Victrola, Daddy. I know that. But the Victrola we have is the downstairs Victrola. Now we are going to have two upstairs Victrolas. Won't that be fun? Why? Well, from now on, said Dad, we are, going, we are going to try to do away with unavoidable delay. The Victrolas will go in the bathrooms, one in the boys' bathroom and the other in the girls' bathroom. I'll bet we'll be the only family in town with a Victrola in every bath. And when you were taking a bath or brushing your teeth or otherwise occupied, you will play the Victrolas. Why? 
Why, 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 mimicked Dad. Why this and why that? Does there have to be a why for everything? There doesn't have to be, Daddy, Ernestine explained patiently. But with you, there usually is. When you start talking about unavoidable delay and Victrolas, dance music is not the first thing that pops into our minds. No, Dad admitted, it's not dance music. But you're going to find that it is just as good in a way and more educational. What kind of records are they? Anne asked. Well, Dad said, they are very entertaining. They are French and German language lesson records. You don't have to listen to them consciously. Just play them, and they'll finally make an impression. Oh, no. Dad's soon tired of diplomacy and psychology. Shut up and listen to me, he roared. I have spent $160 for this equipment. Did I get it for myself? I most emphatically by Jingo well did not. I happen already to be able to speak German and French with such fluency that I frequently am, mix am mistaken for a native of both of those countries. This was at best a terribly gross exaggeration, for while Dad had studied languages for most of his adult life, he never had become very familiar with French, although he could stumble along very, fairly well in German. Usually he insisted that Mother accompany him as an, uh, as an interpreter on his business trips to Europe. Languages came naturally to Mother. No, Dad continued, I did not buy this expensive equipment for myself, although I must say I would like nothing better than to have my own private Victrola and my own private language records. I bought it for you as a present, and you are going to use it. If those two Victrolas aren't going every morning from the minute you get up until you come down to breakfast, I'm going to know the reason why. One reason, said Bill, might be that it is impossible to change records while you are in the bathtub. A person who applies motion study can be in and out of the tub in the time it takes one record to play. That was perfectly true. Dad would sit in the tub and put the soap in his right hand. Then he'd place his right hand on his left shoulder and run it down the top of his left arm, back up the bottom of his left arm to his armpit, down his side, down the outside of his left leg, and then up the inside of his left leg. Then he'd, then he'd change the soap to his left hand and do the same thing to his right side. After a couple of circular strokes on his midsection and his back, and some special attention to his feet and face, he'd duck under for a rinse and get out. He had all the boys in the bathroom several times to demonstrate just how he did it, and he sat in the middle of the living room rug one day with all of his clothes on to teach the girls. So there was no more unavoidable delay in the bathroom, and it wasn't long before we were all speaking at least a pigeon variety of French and German. For ten years, the Victrolas ground out their lessons on the second floor of our Montclair house. As we became fairly fluent, we often would speak the languages at the dinner table. Dad was left out of the conversation when the talk was in French. Your German accents are not so bad, he said. I can understand most of what you can say when you talk German, but your French accents are so atrocious that no one but yourselves could possibly understand you. I believe you've dealt, developed some exotic language all your own, which has no more relation to French than it does to Pig Latin. We giggled and he turned furiously to mother. Don't you think so, Lily? Well, dear, she said, I don't think anyone would mistake them for natives of France, but I can usually make out what they're getting at. That, said Dad with some dignity, is because you learned your French in this country, where everybody talks with an accent, whereas my knowledge of the language came straight from the streets of Paris. Maybe so, dear, said Mother. Maybe so. That night, Dad moved the boys' bathroom Victrola into his bedroom, and we heard him playing French records far into the night. At about, this, at about the time that he brought home the Victrolas, Dad became a consultant to the Remington Typewriter Company, and through motion study methods, helped Remington develop the world's fastest typist. He told us about it one night at dinner, how he had put little flashing lights on the fingers of the typist and taken moving pictures and time exposures to see just what motions she employed and how those motions could be reduced. Anyone can learn to type fast, Dad concluded. 
Why, I've got a system that will teach touch typing in two weeks. Absolutely guaranteed. You could see the great, you could see the great experiment hatching in his mind. In two weeks, he repeated. Why, I could even teach a child to touch, to type touch system in two weeks. Can you type touch system, Daddy? Bill asked. In two weeks, said Dad, I could teach a child. Anybody can do it if he will do just exactly what I tell him to do. The next day, he brought home a new, perfectly white typewriter, a gold knife, and an Ingersoll watch. He unwrapped them and put them on the dining room table. Can I try the typewriter, Daddy? asked Mart. Why is the typewriter white? Anne wanted to know. All typewriters I've ever seen were black. It's beautiful, all right, but why is it white? It's white so that it will photograph better, Dad explained. Also, for some reason, anyone who sees a white typewriter wants to type on it. Don't ask me why. It's psychology. All of us wanted to use it, but Dad wouldn't let anyone touch it but himself. This is an optional experiment, he said. I believe I can teach the touch system in two weeks. Anyone who wants to learn will be able to practice on the white machine. The one who can type the fastest at the end of two weeks will receive the typewriter as a present. The knife and watch will be prizes awarded on a handicap basis, taking age into consideration. Except for the two youngest, who still weren't talking, we all said we wanted to learn. Can I practice first, Daddy? Lil asked. No one practices until I say practice. Now first I will show you how the typewriter works. Dad got a sheet of paper. The paper goes in here. You turn this, so. And you push the carriage over to the end of the line, like this. And Dad, using two fingers, hesit hesitantly picked out the first thing that came to his mind, his name. Is that the touch system, Daddy? Bill asked. No, said Dad. I'll show you the touch system in a little while. Do you know the touch system, Daddy? Let's say I know how to teach it, Billy Boy. But do you know it yourself, Daddy? I know how to teach it, Dad shouted. In two weeks, I can teach it to a child. Do you hear me? I have just finished helping to develop the fastest typist in the world. Do you hear that? They call me Caruso's voice teacher who can sing a by jingo they, they tell me Caruso's voice teacher can't sing a by jingo note. Does that answer your question? I guess so, said Bill. Any other questions? There weren't. Dad then brought out some paper diagrams of a typewriter keyboard and passed one to each of us. The first thing you have to do is memorize that keyboard. Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. These are the letters in the top line. Memorize them. Get to know them forward and backward. Get to know them so that you can say them with your eyes closed. Like this. Dad closed his right eye, but kept his left open just a slit so that he could still read, read the chart. Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. See what I mean? Get to, know them in your, get to know them in your sleep. That's the first step. We looked crestfallen. I know you want to try out that white typewriter. Pretty, isn't it? He clicked a few keys. Runs as smoothly as a watch, doesn't it? We said it did. Well, tomorrow or the next day, you'll be using it. First, you have to memorize the keyboard. Then you've got to learn what fingers to use. Then you'll graduate to Moby Dick here, and one of you will win him. Once we had memorized the keyboard, our fingers were colored with chalk. The little fingers were colored blue, the index fingers red, and so forth. Corresponding colors were placed on the key zones of the diagrams. For instance, the Q, A, and Z, all of which were hit with the little finger on the, of the left hand, were colored blue to match the blue little finger. All you have to do now is practice until each finger has learned the right color habit, Dad said. And once you've got that, we'll be ready to start. In two days, we were fairly adept at matching the colors on our fingers with the colors on the keyboard diagrams. Ernestine was the fastest and got the first chance to sit down at the white typewriter. She hitched her chair up to it confidently while we all gathered round. Hey, no fair, Daddy, she wailed. You've put blank caps on all the keys. I can't see what I'm typing. Blank caps are fairly common now, but Dad had thought up the idea and had them made 
especially by the Remington Company. You don't have to see, Dad said. Just imagine that those keys are colored and type just like you just like you were typing on the diagram. Ern started slowly and then picked up speed as her fingers jumped instinctively from key to key. Dad stood in back of her with a pencil in one hand and a diagram in the other. Every time she made a mistake, he brought the pencil down on the top of her head. Stop it, Daddy, that hurts. I can't concentrate knowing that that pencil's about to descend on my head. It's meant to hurt. Your head has to teach your fingers not to make mistakes. Ern typed along. About every fifth word, she'd make a mistake and the pencil would descend with a bong. But the bongs became less and less frequent, and finally Dad put away the pencil. That's fine, Ernie, he said. I believe I'll keep you. By the end of the two weeks, all children over six, year old, six years old and mother knew the touch system reasonably well. Dad said he knew it, too. We were a long way from being fast, because nothing but practice gives speed, but we were reasonably accurate. Dad entered Ernestine's name in a national speed contest as a sort of child prodigy, but mother talked him out of it and Ern never actually competed. It's not that I want to show her off, he told mother. It's just that I want to do the people a favor, to show them what can be done with proper instructional methods and motion study. I don't think it would be too good, on, good an idea, dear, mother said. Ernestine is high strung and the children are conceited enough as it is. Dad compromised by taking moving pictures of each of us, first with colored fing fingers practicing on the paper diagrams and then actually working on the typewriter. He said the pictures were for my files, but about a month later they were released in a newsreel, which showed everything except the pencil descending on our heads. And some of us today recoil every time we touch the backspace key. Since Dad thought eating was a form of unavoidable delay, he utilized the dinner hour as an instruction period. His primary rule was that no one could talk unless the subject was of general interest. Dad was the one who decided what subjects were of general interest. Since he was convinced that everything he uttered was interesting, the rest of the family had trouble getting a word in edgewise. Honestly, we have the stupidest boy in our history class, Anne would begin. Is he cute? Ernestine asked. Not of general interest, Dad roared. I'm interested, Mart, Mart said. But I, Dad announced, am bored stiff. Now, if Anne had seen a two-headed boy in history class, that would have been of general interest. Usually at the start of a meal, while Mother served up the plates at one end of the table, Dad served up the day's topic of conversation at the other end. I met an engineer today who had just returned from India, he said. What do you think he told me? He believes India has fewer industries for its size than, than has any other country in the world. We knew then that for the duration of that particular meal, even the dullest facts about India would be deemed of exceptional general interest, whereas neighboring Siam, Persia, China, and Mongolia would, for some reason, be considered of but slight general interest, and events which had transpired in Montclair, New Jersey, would be deemed of no interest whatsoever. Once India had been selected as the destination, Dad would head toward it as relentlessly as if Garcia were waiting there and we had the message. Sometimes the topic of conversation was a motion study project, such as clearing off the dishes from the table. Motion study was always of great general interest. Is it better to stack the dishes on the table so that you can carry out a big pile, Dad asked? Or is it better to take a few of them at a time into the butler's pantry where you can rinse them while you stack? After dinner, we'll divide the table into two parts and try one method on one part and the other method on the other. I'll time you. Also of exceptional general interest was a series of tricks whereby dad could multiply large numbers in his head without using pencil and paper. The explanation of how the tricks are worked is too complicated to explain in detail here and two fairly elemental examples should suffice. To multiply 46 times 46, you figure, you figure how much greater 46 is than 25. The answer is 21. Then you figure out how much less 46 is than 50. The answer is four. You can square the four and get 16. 
you put the 22 and the 16 together and the answer is 2116 or 2116. To multiply 44 times 44, you figure, you figure out how much greater 44 is than 25. The answer is 19. Then you figure how much less 44 is than 50. The answer is six. You square the six and you get 36. You put the 19 and the 36 together and the answer is 1936 or 1,936. I want to teach all of you how to multiply two digit numbers in your head, Dad announced at dinner. Not of general interest, said Anne. Now, if you had learned to multiply a two-digit number by a two-headed two calf, Ern suggested. Those who do not think it is of general interest may leave the table and go to their rooms, Dad said coldly. And I understand there is apple pie for dessert. Nobody left. Since everyone now appears to be interested, said Dad, I will explain how it's done. It was a complicated thing for children to understand, and it and it involved memorizing the squares of all numbers up to 25. But dad took it slowly and within a couple of months, the older children had learned all the tricks involved. While mother carved and served the plates, dad sometimes carved wood for a hobby, but he never touched a carving knife at the table. Dad would shout out problems in mental arithmetic for us. 19 times 27, 19 times 20, 17, 323, right. Good boy, Bill. 52 times 52. 2704. Right. Good girl, Martha. Dan was five when this was going on, and Jack was three. One night at supper, Dad was firing questions at Dan on the squares of numbers up to 25. This involved straight memory and no mental arithmetic. 15 times 15, said Dad. 225, said Dan. 16 times 16, said Dad. Jack, sitting in his high chair next to Mother, gave the answer. 256. At first, Dad was irritated because he thought one of, the, uh, uh, one of the older children was butting in. I'm asking Dan, he said. You older children stop showing off and... Then he registered a double take. What did you say, Jackie boy? Dad cooed. 256. Dad drew a nickel out of his pocket and grew very serious. Have you been memorizing the squares as I asked the questions to the older children, Jackie? Jack didn't know whether that was good or bad, but he nodded. If you can tell me what 17 times 17 is, Jackie boy, this nickel is yours. Sure, Daddy, said Jack. 289. Dad passed him the nickel and turned beaming to Mother. Lily, he said, we'd better keep that boy, too. Martha, at 11, became the fastest in the family at mental arithmetics, at mental mathematics. Still feeling frustrated because he hadn't been able to take Ernestine to the speed typing contest, Dad insisted on taking Martha to an adding machine exhibition in New York. No, Lily, he told Mother, this one is not high strung. I was willing to compromise on moving pictures of the typing, but you can't take movie movies of this. She goes to New York with me. Martha stood up on a platform at the adding machine show and answered the problems quicker than the calculators could operate. Dad, of course, stood alongside her. After the final applause, he told the assemblage modestly, there's really nothing to it. I've got a boy named Jack at home who's almost as good as she is. I would have brought him here with me, but Mil Mrs. Gilbreth said he's still too young. Maybe next, maybe next year when he's four. By this time, all of us had begun to suspect that Dad had his points as a teacher and that he knew what he was talking about. There was one time, though, when he failed. Tomorrow, he told us at dinner, I'm going to make a cement bird bath. All those who want to watch me should come home right after school and will make it in the late afternoon. Dad had long since given up general contracting to devote all of his time to scientific management and motion study. But we knew he had been an expert bricklayer and had written a book on reinforced concrete. The next afternoon, he built a mold, mixed his concrete confidently, and poured his bird bath. We'll let it set for a while and then take the mold off, he said. 
Dad had to go out of town for a few weeks. When he returned, he changed into old clothes, whistled assembly, and let us out into the yard. I've had this bird bath on my mind all the time I was away, he said. It should be good and hard now. Will the birds come and take a bath in it, Daddy? Fred asked. I would say, Freddy, that the birds will come for miles to take a bath in it. Indeed, on Saturday nights, I would say the birds will be standing in line to use our lovely bathtub. He leaned over the mold. Stand back, everybody, he said. We will now unveil the masterpiece. Get your towels ready, little birdies. It's almost bathing time. We stood hushed and waiting. But as he lift lifted the birdbath out of the mold, there was an unbelievable grating sound, and a pile of dust and rubble lay at our feet. Dad stood deflated and silent. He took it so seriously that we felt sorry for him. Never mind, Daddy, Lil said. We know you tried anyway. Bill, Dad said sternly. Did you? Did I what, Daddy? Did you touch my bird bath? No, Daddy, honest. Dad reached down and picked up some of the concrete. It crumbled into dust between his fingers. Too much sand, he muttered. And then to Bill, no, it's my fault. Too much sand. I know you didn't touch it, and I'm sorry I implied that you did. But you couldn't keep Dad down for long. Well, he said, that didn't work out so very well. But I built some of the finest and tallest buildings in the whole world. And some bridges and roads and canals that stretch for miles and miles. Is a birdbath harder to build than a tall building, Daddy? asked Dan. Dad, deflated all over again, kicked the rubble with his toe and started toward the house. Too much sand, he muttered. And that is the end of chapter six. And tomorrow night we will continue with chapter seven. Have a good night, everyone.